Good day, Harold. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. It's my pleasure, Guy. Really nice to be here today. For our audience, would you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about where you grew up and where you went to college and what you studied? Okay, I, um, I grew up in uh, the Rocky Mountains in British Columbia, Canada. And uh, as soon as I graduated from high school, I joined the Army and I went to the Royal Military College, which is like the U.S.'s uh, West Point. As a matter of fact, went to West, West Point where we play an annual hockey game against the two uh, colleges and schools. And uh, I then uh, served uh, a total of uh, 21 years in the military. And uh, my early career, I was an infantry officer. And so training was definitely part of everything. And as an, as an officer, we learned things like methods of instruction, teaching techniques, and those things. Um, I then uh, I finished up my career as a training development officer, uh, which is uh, basically um, an HPT uh, instructional design slash whatever uh, specialist. And I spent the last five years uh, designing helicopter training. We had just uh, a purchased a new fleet of helicopters to support the Army. And uh, I was there to what we called, uh, we designed the training standards, training plans. And then I, uh, the big part of my project was integrating technology into the uh, training spectrum, particularly uh, computer-based training at the time. Uh, this was pre-web-based. Uh, I started working on that project in 94 and, uh, and flight simulation. And it was uh, the flight simulation component that uh, threw me into uh, technology and, uh, and then later the internet because um, my undergraduate degree is in history and I prided myself on having taken only one computer uh, programming course in Fortran back in the 70s, which I failed. And the professor called me in and he said, young man, he said, are you taking any more computer uh, courses here at, at, at the school? And I said, not if I don't have to, sir. He said, good, you pass. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the extent of my, of my uh, uh, computer training until the mid-90s. Um, uh, 95, I saw my first web page. And it blew my mind. So for the first time, I realized that this internet thing, um, it wasn't about computers. It was about connecting people. Because they showed us, a, uh, I was in Montreal, and they showed us this web page from Germany. And it was kind of like, I can, I can read it, and I can, I can see stuff that people are putting up all over the world. And it was like the big click happened to me. And, um, and, and this was at the same time, so I had transferred into, um, so, uh, into the training development branch. So again, around, and that was in 93, and I took a year-long uh, course in instructional design, kind of, or actually instructional systems design, so all, all things. But um, they were informed out of uh, Concordia University and uh, the program that they had there, the MA in Ed Tech, and it was very closely linked to ISPI and human performance technology and performance analysis. So one of the first things we learned was how to do operational analyses and performance analyses and we had all the books at the time about that. So that for me, the uh, and that, so I knew training and I knew operations as a pointy end infantry guy. And the part of, of, of performance, performance support, performance technology that just made sense for me was you put the operational stuff first, right? Then you train or do or support the way it has to be done. And, 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 and as an infantry guy, it was like, duh. <laughs> it was, it was like, I get this, right? It wasn't about making the nicest, sh shiniest, fancy course. It was supporting people in the work and making sure that what we were doing was, was, was working at. Like one of the things that we had with flight simulation was that uh, we were looking at things that they called negative transfer. Okay, if we teach you something uh, in, in the classroom or in the simulator one way, does it actually transfer to the aircraft? And we, we had a $25 million full motion flight simulator. And one of the problems was that um, the hovering technique was different. It, like what you physically had to do uh, to, to hover in the, um, in, in the simulator was not the same as in the aircraft. So one of the things that we would do is that the flight instructors would take the aircraft up, put it in hover, and say, okay, now you, now you take over and do that. Because we don't want you to get the wrong cues in your brain. Um, when you actually jump into the aircraft. So that was, anyway, real interesting stuff going through that. So that was my first career. Mm -hmm. um, 
my last uh, four years in the military while I was doing this uh, flight simulation and stuff like that, I went back to school. I started in the MA Ed Tech program um, at Concordia, but I got transferred and I finished doing um, a master's of education at the University of New Brunswick here where I, I live in New Brunswick now. And there, I, uh, I, I, for my thesis, I took a look at, it was called Learning in the Information Technology Workplace. And so I interviewed dozens of different companies. A lot, of, a lot of my work was informed by Marshall McLuhan, who was a communications and media theorist. But I was really interested in how is the technology affecting us? You know, um, there's a there's a saying that you know, uh, you know, first we shape our tools, and then our tools shape us. And I was wondering was how were the tools shaping um, how people were working and learning going through that? But again, that was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I finished my master's. I retired from the military. I worked at a university as um, uh, he here that um, I was the project manager learning and performance systems. So very much an HPT focus. Mm -hmm. uh, we were externally uh, a focused organization. Did that for three years. Then I went to an e-learning company when e-learning was super hot. I was the chief learning officer and we had an LMS. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I, I, I know all about selling that stuff which is why I don't do it anymore. Um, and then in 2003, uh, well, my, uh, I was fired. Uh, we, we came under new management at the company. And f since 2003, I've been a freelancer uh, here in Sackville, New Brunswick, population 5,000. So, Very kind cool. of Thank you. Thank you for giving that, that update. So can you tell us about, so what do you do now? Okay, so, so now um, my focus is really on how people can make sense. So in other words, keep, keep current, understand what's going on in networks, those very loose professional networks, in communities of practice, and also in work teams. So also those three different, those three different levels of where you're either working to get something done or kind of what we're doing right now where, I mean, I would consider us members of a loose community of practice, right? And where we're, we're, and, and, and where we're all trying to up our game. Yes, thank you. Can you share with us some of the more interesting projects that you worked on? I mean, that, that helicopter story, that was pretty cool here, because now I, I would be fearful of helicopters over the, over me in the skies. But uh, so what, what kinds of things can you share with the audience here in terms of your uh, experience? Yeah, well, the, the, I mean, the, the, the helicopter one and simulation, I mean, a $25 million flight simulator outside my office uh, was, was, was pretty fantastic. And, uh, and I mean, it was a $1 billion project total. Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah, it was like, I don't work in those, those size projects anymore. Um, probably one of the more interesting ones was about, I don't know, eight, nine years ago. And uh, Jay Cross and I worked on that. And I'll talk about Jay a bit more. So he was my business partner. And we were working for Cigna, the, 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 health, the health insurance company. And one of the things that they were doing is that they wanted to uh, changed the way the corporate university worked and they wanted to move away from pushing courses out to basically drawing stuff in from the lines of business and I worked with them for about a year and we focused on things like what, what they call do-it-yourself learning uh, which is how do you take control of okay this is what I got to be able to learn this is the right way to do it this is the person to connect to this is when I do it and this is how I measure with whether I'm actually able to do what it is that I want to do. So, so, so that went throughout the company. They also um, embedded performance consultants into the lines of business. So they, they shut down their entire instructional design shop and they decided that if we get to the point where we decide we're going to have a course, we're outsourcing it. And this is our provider, and, and, and we do basically the front end and the back end. Back end. We spec the course and then, we ver and then we verify it that it meets our ends. Uh, our, our requirements we check off but our focus is on improving performance and uh, and and that was a for some people that was a very painful process and a lot of people were let go or quit during that time i can imagine that's a that's a huge shift so what were some of the lessons or insights that you took away from that kind of experience Try, helping people to make that shift one of the uh, things was is that uh, what we realized that well, at the end was that uh, when we took a look at the background of the people on the new performance innovation team is that 
not all of them came from the learning field. We had people came from marketing and sales and tech and all different fields, um, and uh, and which me meant that it was a more uh, diversified uh, team. And that, that was. The other thing that we did, we spent a lot of time on at the beginning, was that we built uh, with, we didn't deliver this, we, we did this together, we built a, a credo, a credo of beliefs. It says, this is what we believe in. And, you know, like one of the things that, that, that came out of the credo is that, you know, we believe in narrating our work. We believe in letting people know what we're doing. We believe in experimenting and, uh, and are willing to fail and learn from that failure. Uh, we, uh, we we believe that work is learning and that learning is the work and that they have to be integrated. So there was a system of those ones and that was built with the, the core team which was about a dozen people. And and, and, and these people were spread all over the country. Um, I mean, Cigna is a big company. Uh, but the other thing that we did that really helped was that we started, uh, so we did some on-sites and then everyone went back to where they where they worked. And we started with daily coffee. We had a we had a, fo a phone call at like ten o'clock in the morning, and it was a quick round the table. And we were also working with an enterprise social network, and, was, and we would point back and say, you know, hey, 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 guy, how come you didn't post anything yesterday? Like, you know, you got to be working out loud here. Was, oh, yeah, you're right. I guess I didn't do that. Um, and we did that daily, and then it was every second day, and then it was once a week. But it was a very high touch type of thing, and that whole behavior reinforcement is that you got to do this stuff and keep doing it and practice doing it and, until it finally sinks into you um, and uh, so 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 that was yeah the, the change process was pretty significant uh, the technology we went through a number for, we weren't in charge of the technology so the company was throwing these things out and, and here and there and it was oh now we get to use this and okay let's see how that goes and, you know, my lesson is, you know, save the tech till the very, very end, if possible. That's interesting about, th thank you for sharing all of that. Uh, so as you, as people work out loud, can you give us an example for the audience in terms of, you know, what does that constitute? I mean, nobody wants a step-by-step, blow-by-blow, minute-by-minute description of what Guy did uh, on some project or whatever. So what's the essence of what, what's helpful to others that we should convey? Yeah, I liken it to, imagine if we all worked in the same room, right? I'd be able to know what you're working on, and I'd hear guys say, oh, my Lord, I don't know what i got to deal with this or something. And you go, hey, what's the matter? What's happening over there? Um, when you work apart, you don't see that. And so you, you, you think about it as, what would I want to know about other people? And it's things like, well, I'm, okay, you, you, part of working out loud. Today I'm working on the so-and-so report. It's going to take me all day to do it. I've got to get it out for tomorrow. And... Where that can help the team is that somebody might say, somebody would see that in the stream of whatever you're using to share to work out loud with. And they say, hey, I did that report last year. Do you want to see the copy of it? Or this is what I learned. Oh, yeah, sure. That's, that's wonderful, right? Because they don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. So the working out loud, narrating your work is about letting people know that kind of stuff. And the more you do it, the more you start understanding what's the important stuff to share and what's the stuff that's really not important. And sometimes you don't know. Sometimes it's sometimes something that you share is um, something that happens um, uh, today, but it's only important a month from now. So one example is, so I was working with AstraZeneca, they're the um, pharmaceutical company. And uh, one of the, um, I, I was meeting with, uh, the people I was working with were uh, design chemists. So they're the folks who, who, who go from what they call in silica, in other words, in the computer, to in vitro to actually try to build this new molecule. Right? And if you have 10,000 options, you can only do so many in vitro, and you have to make decisions on okay, because each one they all cost money to, you know, when you, when you take them out of the computer to do that, and so what, they would have these meetings, and they would they would say okay, these are the ten molecules that we want to go uh, in, into the lab, and this is why we want to check them out. Well, that works. We think those are the right things to uh, the, to collect. Well, a few years later, um, they found out that you know one of the things that we were we thought we couldn't do, we now can do. So all those molecules that we rejected for this reason, we should actually go back and look at them. Ah, but we didn't record why, why, we, we, why we rejected these. And, and, and it was like, you know, we've now got all this data that we just can't parse. Uh, so 
that's the thing about working out loud. I like that example because we don't know what we what we think is going to be important in the future. So sharing things, tagging things, making them findable. Mm -hmm. uh, for later that somebody wants to go. It's like blogging. I mean, who knows if some blog from 10 years ago is going to be of interest to somebody or not, but at least it's there and I can keyword search it or tag it or something like that. So it would seem that part of uh, working out loud uh, and sharing would be documentation. Yeah, documentation and also, I mean, it's like the difference between taxonomies and folksonomies. So Thomas van der Waal came up with the term folksonomy, and basically what that is, it's a it's a bottom up taxonomy. It's okay, the tags and the and and the criteria that people are using are the ones that we want to use. So everybody's using this word, well, that's the one that gets floated up uh, doing that kind of thing. So the thing, documentation, I think, or recording, making things findable mm -hmm. is really important. Making them perfect documents uh, in a lot of cases is not that important. I agree. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So you've shared with us a little bit about your first exposure to what I call HPT, human performance technology, and others might call it evidence-based practices for performance improvement, and ASTD, now ATD, back in the day called it the HPI, human performance improvement, uh, performance technology, performance improvement, lots of different words for this. Um, so can we dive a little bit deeper into that first exposure that you had? But first of all, let's start with what the heck do you call this stuff? Probably HPT because because I was a CPT um, at one time. Um, um, performance improvement maybe, but that's more of a narrower field. Uh, the um, What was the term you used about uh, evidence-based? Evidence-based uh, practices for performance yeah. improvement. Yeah, that's one. I, uh, that's a new one to me. So, so, so I, I don't. I made that know. up. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, the way the way that I saw um, HPT particularly was um, uh, the front end of uh, getting to uh, make decisions on how are we going to help people work, right? And so what the, what HPT in particular the performance analysis process allows you to do is to decide it, should we train this or should we not train this, and you're familiar probably with the train no train decision trees um, and then also well and if we're and, and what are the kinds of things that we should be training people on um, and one of the things that we shouldn't be and it well and if, if, if training is one solution what are the other solutions you know and and the, the great thing about the internet and the web is that we're getting more types of solutions so things like um, promoting a community of practice, which is a fuzzy solution, but is good for things like improving or, or sharing tacit knowledge, right? And, and that's not the kind of thing that, that really fits in well into a performance analysis uh, piece. So the performance analysis, like you want to train helicopter pilots in the best way possible to fly a helicopter, yeah, that's wonderful. But when we start getting into tactics, or we start getting into what happens in the theater of operations, there, things like, you know, peer groups, communities of practice, um, uh, ways in which people can collaborate. Uh, one, of the, one of the best examples out of, the, um, out of the Iraq war was Company Command, which was one of the first communities of practice online. And you had to be an infantry company commander, either going to be one or have, or have been one, to join this group. And in this group, they were sharing real-time uh, knowledge. Right? I mean, and, and interesting things like, okay, when you're going out on patrol, you've you got your rations and, you know, the stuff that you get. Well, there's, you, you don't want to be taking uh, your uh, chocolate bars with you because they melt at 40 degrees Celsius, right? I mean, it's like you're, you're, you're out in the desert. But Jolly Ranchers, they're nice and hard, and you can pop one in. And so make sure that you guys don't take any take any of that kind of stuff, and they, and they take the Jolly Ranchers with them. I mean, these little things that actually could save somebody's life. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, the technology has helped us do things that we were really good at doing close together, and, and now, we, and now we, have, we have more options. And, and I really saw HPT as um, taking... Uh, because there are a lot of roots in instructional design and in uh, uh, like ISPI, used to call the Institute for uh, Programmed Instruction, I think. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, right. <laughs> and so, so instruction is fine, right? But we, we, can, we can take that human performance thing and we now can incorporate a whole bunch of more tools. Like, I mean, the, the wonderful work that uh, Gloria Gary did on, um, uh, on, on electronic performance support systems, right? And, and said, you know, we can put a whole bunch of stuff at the point of need. Right, um, and uh, so so so, 
I think HPT is 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 wider front end for taking a look at helping people work, and and, and that's what I saw. It I mean for me is I, I could never see myself as an instructional designer without the without the HPT umbrella because then all you are is an order taker, mm-hmm. and yeah, whereas understand the performance requirements, understand the business requirements, and then take a look at what you're. Thank you for sharing that. Can you share uh, with us as a pointer for our audience, uh, who are some of your early influences in this world of HPT, either people or articles or books that you might recommend for people who are beginning to climb this uh, learning and performance curve? Yeah, I would say that um, in terms of, I mean, for books, the the big book for me was Roger Kaufman's um, uh, Strategic What's it called? I have to look at my notes on that. Um, uh, Strategic Planning for Success. I'm not too too sure if it's still out there. Gloria Gary's uh, book on electronic performance support systems was a classic. Uh, There are probably more up-to-date books on that. I think that um, there was a book put out on performance improvement. uh, I think ATD had one that came out a little little while ago. But uh, um, uh, there was a a Gene... um, uh, What's her name? You uh, you probably know. Uh, uh, she, she, I'm blanking here on that. Starts with sorry. starts with an F. Starts with an F. A gene. Uh, not to, anyway, um, but but basically, th- there are a number of books. So in the early days for me, it was the EPSS book. It was Roger Kaufman's book uh, that were that were big uh, influences in terms of the people. Um, Gary Rumler. Um, I, I had the fortune to to attend some ISPI workshops run by Gary Rumler and Roger Addison, and uh, they really helped focus it. I would say that if, there, if you can find a book by Gary Rumler, it's, it's, it's worth the investment. I never got to meet people like Joe Harless, um, but I know that he was very influential in that. Um, and then um, for, for me, in terms of uh, books, is that uh, my, uh, my business partner, uh, Jay Cross, uh, wrote in 2006 a book on informal learning and uh, his the big metaphor was um, you know formal learning formal instruction is like r- taking the bus you get on the bus the bus driver knows where it's going it's got a route and, and we all go on it together and uh, informal learning is like riding a bicycle you go by yourself you stop where you want to you check out this path you go there and you know you sort of it's it's more serendipitous and uh, and I think that that book actually had a real big influence on the field because before that we really didn't talk about informal learning i mean even even performance support is not exactly informal learning it's that they're, they're tools and they, and they support you uh, at the point of need but when we look at informal learning we look at learning through communities of practice um the work that atn Wenger uh, did on communities of practice is is, is, is definitely uh, uh worth looking into and again all it does is it is it expands our uh, view of human performance, which is really humans living, humans working, and that we are multifaceted people, and that there are a whole bunch of different things within our environment that influence how we think and how we learn and what we do. Thank you. Yes. Let me shift gears here a bit. If um, My next question is, if you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do, as a way of providing examples to others, you know, when you get to ask the question, you've got to have your snappy little response here. Uh, you just can't stammer. But uh, so what would your 30-second elevator speech be? Yeah, the 10-second the, the, the one would be I help people adapt to the Internet. That's the 10-second. The 30-second is more um, I'm focused on sense-making in professional networks, in communities of practice, and in work teams each require different types of, uh, of, of skills in that. And that really it's focused on making work is learning and learning is the work. Yes, let's uh, segue here off of the uh, scripted questions to talk a little bit about your uh, personal knowledge mastery series. Um, you have workshops, you have books and articles, blog posts and things like that. But for the audience, can you give us the overview of this and, and then dive deeply wherever you would like to so we can, again, point people to you as a resource and so they can make a decision here as to whether or not this is something that, that they should pursue? Yeah, so uh, Personal Knowledge Mastery, PKM, 
uh, the root of that is again it's the it's the idea of multiple ways of looking at human performance human living and uh, so uh, PKM comes from the KM world from the knowledge management world but one of the problems with knowledge management was the knowledge management which came out in the 80s was about building knowledge bases taxonomies and stuff like that and pumping information from the center to, uh, to the periphery or from the top to the bottom and PKM is the app is the opposite it's about collecting at a at, at an individual level and then helping make the network smarter by sharing appropriately so for me it was um, so uh, PKM which is known as also known as personal knowledge management I changed it to mastery because I really want to focus on the discipline of, of, of practicing it but uh, for me I was introduced it through Lilia Efimova and uh, Lilia was doing her doctorate in the Netherlands at the time and she was looking at how a number of um, researchers were using web logs or blogs uh, for sharing their knowledge and she actually blogged her PhD and came to the, and she was the first person to do that so of course she had big issues with her thesis advisor you can't post this online <laughs> it's not approved yet oh my god so so she was a big inspiration for me and this hit so 2003 I lose my job I, I live here in Sackville, New Brunswick, population 5,000. I have no work. Um, I'm in a very rural area. I mean, this is a friend of mine calls this the Deep East. Um, and uh, it is kind of it's kind of like the Deep South. Uh, again, very, very rural, um, s small population, no big businesses here. And so I used uh, the Internet to start uh, connecting with people. And uh, reading Lilia's work, I started working out loud and I started posting stuff about what this P what is PKM to me? What what tools am I using? And in 2003, 2004, the tool was was a blog and I think I had social bookmarks, I think, and oh and aggregators, I think, were out then too. So I had a few tools to try to, you know, parse my uh, knowledge network and try filter it and try to try to make sense of it. And I kept writing about it. And it was about oh, seven or eight years later, I get a I get a phone call from the head of uh, leadership training at Domino's Pizza. And he said, I really like what you've been writing about PKM. We'd like to incorporate this into our leadership training for our franchise owners. So I got to go to Ann Arbor, and uh, anyway, we, we, uh, we and, and I, start, I, start, I started seeing that there's something to this. Because, so, like, so what is PKM? PKM is a way of making sense, right, by engaging with professional networks, with communities of practice, and having filters, whether they be human or mechanical types of filters, so I can get the information that I need, having trusted relationships so I can check things, and actually giving to back to my network. Because So here I was, this blogger in 2004, I knew nobody. But by blogging, I mean, that's, I think, how, how you met me, 2007, I think you mentioned, right? Is that that's how I got to meet people like you and Jay Cross. And, you know, I now have a global network, but it was only because I gave. So it's that you have to give to get. It's like kindergarten, you know. <laughs> um, you got to be doing the sharing, and things come back to you, but they don't come back to you directly. So you can't sort of map it out as a linear process, or even like with HPT, you can't say, well, you know, this is the gap, and this is how we fill it. We don't even know what the gap is, right? The gap is immense. Um, so PKM is this model that I've developed over the years, and then for I, I, I taught it at the University of Toronto for a while. One of the problems, they wanted to do a two-day workshop. So I ran this two-day workshop. Everybody loved it. And six months later, nobody's behavior changed. Why? Because there's a lot of stuff you've got to do to change. And to do that, it takes time. And then uh, several of uh, my Dutch colleagues had this Get Online in 40 Days program. And they said, why don't you use our structure with PKM? And I did. And it's now a 60-day program. It's the same content. But it takes time for people to change their behaviors. <laughs> And uh, so I run these online workshops. I have public ones. I also run them for organizations. And uh, it's, it's interesting with the, with the public ones is that probably 30% of the attendees come back. Um, I, have a, I have a take it again for free uh, offer. And sometimes about a year later, two years later, they'll come back and I'll do it. They go, I get this now. Okay, I know what I'm doing with this. Because this stuff takes time. And, and I think one of the reasons that PKM is not making me a million dollars is because it's hard work. It's not an easy check, bang, there you go. To change behavior takes time. 
to build communities, to participate in networks, to find some sense-making process. Like for me, my blog is a core part of my sense-making, but not everybody's a blogger. I mean, you're doing this yourself with your sense-making. You're making sense of the HPT field by interviewing people, you're learning, you're giving back to the network. I mean, you're, you're practicing this right now. Um, so, so the workshops are um, uh, sort of a, a, a core of my, of my business. I've also uh, written um, uh, a number of books or e-books and uh, right now the latest one is Life in Perpetual Beta uh, version 4. And uh, uh, the idea is hopefully, well, since we're all locked down in the COVID-19 pandemic, um, hopefully I'll have time to uh, get to work on my, on my next book uh, on that. But this, the, the, the latest one is just, just over a year old, so it's not too bad. So when I was looking at your website in preparation for this, I saw that your four books, e-books, which I think that you just said here, the, the, one is, the, the latest one is uh, rather new, but I had seen three, and then uh, yesterday I saw that you had four, and then you collapsed them all into one e-book. But uh, this is what you're, you're hoping to work on here as we all uh, hunker down uh, during the pandemic. Yeah, because the, the four ebooks, the first ebook I wrote uh, was um, I took 10 years of blogging and I synthesized and hacked and uh, got it down and I got a professional editor to go through it and say, okay, here's, like, here's a knowledge object of 10 years of writing about lots of stuff and PKM being one, but not, uh, I've talked about leadership and, and, and other things. And then um, I, uh, the other ones, uh, the, the next one focused on more on PKM, because I really wanted to sort of go deeper on that. And then the next one focused on leadership, and then the last one focused on models, okay, a number of different types of models that, that, that can be used. And then when I and then decided to put all four of them together, get rid of the old stuff, synthesize it better, and now it's like a, it's about a 100-page um, uh, ebook that covers all these things, and I try to keep it you know, as up to date as possible. That's why it's called life and perpetual data, yeah. constantly changing. I, I like that phrase. Um, <laughs> share with us a little bit about your. Uh, I believe you call it Fridays Finds, is it? Oh yeah, yeah, Friday, Friday, yeah. So, fr so one of the things about uh, blogging is that it's kind of hard to come up with something original every day, right? And uh, and as a blogger, I remember I had a friend of mine who uh, took me over to his house and he said, "You you have to learn how to use this Twitter thing." I said, "What?" He says, get over here. He says, here's a beer. Now pay attention. And he said, you have to use Twitter. Okay, so I tried to figure it out. And, and I kind of got, I figured out Twitter. I said, yeah, Twitter's like, like this big cocktail party where you can sort of just, you know, go around and see who's doing what and things like that. And then, but, at, but a year into using Twitter, I realized that I've, I've written all this stuff and I've seen all these things, and but I'm not doing anything with it. I said, this is really kind of, so... What Friday's Finds uh, started out as was, was just Twitter, but now it's sort of all the other things I've plugged into. And it's, so all the stuff during a two-week period, I keep track of. I, I either favorite it or I put it into a social bookmark or something like that. And then every Thursday evening or Friday morning, I write a post called Friday's Finds. And I go through sometimes hundreds of these things, and I call, 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 call. And I go like that. Yeah, that's a keeper. That's a keeper. That's a keeper. And sometimes I actually see a theme that comes through all that. So, uh, oh, people, all these people were talking about the same thing. That's interesting. So I now have several hundred of these Fridays finds. And one of the cool things that I find about it is that um, uh, in my WordPress uh, blog, I can go in and I can search just those things tagged Fridays finds. And what I'm finding is I'm finding comments and re references and resources from people that aren't me so it becomes so say i call my blog my outboard brain but this is you know a collected outboard brain of a whole bunch of other people and uh, i know some people a good friend of mine who used to be the knowledge management uh, uh, officer at shell and uh, he said he said harold i know what you think i'm not reading your blog post anymore but friday's fine yeah that's the one that i pay attention to i want to know what you're interested in <laughs> Yeah, that's very cool. I, I really like that. So are you doing a similar thing on LinkedIn? Uh, LinkedIn, which I, it's like one level above Facebook, and I'm not on Facebook. Um, I, I was going to go there next about There's, Facebook because I know how you feel about it. But So what's your take on LinkedIn and, and the value proposition or the warnings that you yeah. might share? Yeah, LinkedIn is a bit of a cesspool, but it's because... 
a lot of executives are, are on it. It's one of the few social networks that a lot of businesses allow you to connect with. It's where my clients and my potential clients are. Um, trying to find stuff after you've seen it on LinkedIn, that, that they do at least have the save option now, which they didn't have before. And of course, it's it's fed by an algorithm. You can go, you can decide to take a look at things um, in chronological order, but it kicks you back in to the algorithm. So it decides what's important. You don't. You have no control over that. Um, I personally use LinkedIn as a um, uh, an open for business sign. It says, yeah, I'm here, you guys are there. Um, quite often I will uh, post my blog post to LinkedIn because a lot of people don't subscribe to my blog, but they're, they may be interested in what, I, in what I've got. I actually wrote for LinkedIn Pulse for about two years. I, I wrote separate articles, and I found they were getting less traffic than my blog was and uh, sort of less interest, and I thought, why should I be giving free content to LinkedIn? So I just refer back to my blog. Where, where that is. Um, I have had some good conversations on there. Um, I had deeper conversations on Google+. Plus. Google+, Plus was like a real tribal community. And like, like if you were a mathematician, there was a core group of people. And there was a core group of people working on certain aspects of tech. Um, and it was really good for very long, deeper discussions as opposed to the sort of the drive-by shooting that you get on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, it, it is, I am on the network. Um, I don't discriminate. People want to connect with me. I always say yes. Um, and I learned that because a lot of times people ask to connect first and then they talk to you. Mm-hmm. And so if I say, if, if I went, I don't know that person. Yeah. But maybe that person doesn't want to talk to you. And, uh, so it sort of go, it, it goes along that way. There are other people who use it more focused and there's, and there's stuff you can definitely read on it. I'm just not a LinkedIn expert. So let's shift over to uh, Facebook because I think I've read uh, a numerous times on Twitter some of your sentiments about Facebook. Do you mind sharing them here? Well, I mean, you could watch the social network. You could see what Cambridge Analytica has done. Um, yeah, Facebook is just um, a big hoovering operation to uh, get our data. Well, I. I'm on Facebook. I see everybody's on Facebook. If you're not on Facebook, they have what's called a social graph. And all it is, it's, it's to map out my social relationships so they can then sell the aggregated data to add. And unfortunately, some of those advertisers are advertising um, political messages. Democratic. So that's where we have issues with it. When this, when this whole COVID-19 thing hit about three weeks to two, two, three weeks ago here, uh, one of the things that happened was that our local market shut down, our local businesses shut down, but people were still uh, organizing ways at the local level so that, oh, I want to pick up some uh, uh, some veggies, I can get them from my local farmer. Um, and the way that they were doing it was through Facebook. And I said, okay, Harold, hold the nose and let's let's start a Facebook account. I lasted five hours. I, I just, I, I, as I'm going through it and I'm seeing all the tracking and the way that I'm being forced down certain paths to do things, I can't just sort of create an account. There's all this other stuff that gets attached to it. And uh, I just, I gave up. I said, no, I said, uh, I'll, I'll walk down the street and try to find my neighbors if, uh, if I can. So, I mean, it is a, uh, they are taking this data and they are using it against us. And there's no control on it. Um, and I do realize that, and, 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 and I realize it's costing so if you're if you if you are selling retail, you got to be on Facebook. Unfortunately, it's 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 kind of like you got to be selling on Amazon and and you know the way that they're pushing small retailers to do things in a certain way and then kicking them off for for, for no reason and suddenly you've lost all your business. Um, it's with platform monopolies is is what they're called. So yeah, it's a, but you know I'm still on I'm still on Twitter and I know there's lots of crap on Twitter. Um, but I find that I can filter the crop on Twitter a lot easier mm-hmm. than, than, than I could with Facebook. Well, thank you for sharing that, because I think that people need to be wary. Uh, they need to be informed, and uh, uh, I think that uh, your concerns and issues are very real. Um, I'm on there playing a little bit, too, but it's because I want to see pictures of my grandchildren. <laughs> so. They, but they they've got my data here. and they're selling it, and uh, I hope I'm not uh, buying for the uh, wrong reasons. Um, my next question, and we've—I th- I th- think we've perhaps talked a little bit about this, but uh, I w- my next question is: 
as a lifelong learner, where is your current focus or your next focus for your own learning? And are, are you writing about any of that? What, what can you share with us? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, if you asked me that question a month ago, it would have been very different. Uh, you know, we've had this epical shift that we're living through and that we don't know where it's going to be coming out. Here in Canada, the government announced that uh, we're going to be in lockdown for sure until July. Um, and uh, that, that's, that's the earliest case is what they're saying. So, yeah, life has, uh, changed, has changed a little bit. So I mentioned I'm, I'm looking at uh, doing a new version of a, of a book. Um, I'm, you know, I have a number of different things. Do I want to focus on PKM? Do I want to talk about some of the other things I have talked about? Or should I wait and should this be a um, um, uh, dealing with, uh, with chaos? type book uh, after the fact of uh, when, we, when we, we we get an idea of where we're going to be in a year's time. Uh, I wrote a post a, about a year ago. It was interesting because John Hagel uh, of uh, Deloitte picked it up and it was called, it's called Learning in Complexity and Chaos. And it basically kind of, it doesn't describe what's happening now, but it describes how we should be dealing with stuff like what is happening now. Oh, that's uh, a good pointer for everyone. Yeah, and Learning in Complexity and Chaos. Cause, uh, and I'm thinking that you know, maybe that's my next book. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the thing is, I I've got to gather a lot of data, and make some observations during the next uh, 12, 12 months or so. Uh, the other thing that um, I'm working on uh, is uh, so I'm currently working um, with Citibank. They're they're my main client and uh, helping to improve uh, collaboration across the enterprise. And with a sudden shift now towards remote work, <laughs> that kind of happened like two, three weeks ago. They said, "Oh, by the way, we're now look, we're now focused on remote work." <laughs> said, okay, <laughs> got that, got that. Um, and uh, I came across a very interesting tool that is also based on uh, some pretty deep research, and it's and, and the tool it's on alignment. It it basically says, "Okay, you folks are all working together. Are you aligned?" In, 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 in the way that you think about certain key uh, things, certain de determinants of, of, of your own behavior. You know, are you aligned in uh, how essential is it for us to have um, a coordinated mission? How essential is it for us to do uh, uh, to uh, build a consensus? So that, and, and again, this is it's based on, on some good behavioral psychological research from several universities. And the tool, uh, the company is called Mirror Mirror, which is a really cool, cool name, right? You know, the old, look, we're both looking into the mirror and going like, "Oh, I didn't realize you thought that was important." And so the the the, the tool there, there's two tools. There's a, there's a quick survey. There's a deep survey, and in the surveys, what they do is that uh, you either fill out a questionnaire and everybody on the team and then that gets analyzed and comes back to you and say you guys are really well aligned in these areas and not that well aligned in those areas we're not going to tell you what to do but that's something and and when this was this was demoed to me about a year and a half ago when Lindsay the, the, the founder she showed this to me and I went you know what if we don't have alignment in this area here something like PKM could help and so I saw this oh that's interesting and now that everybody's going to be working remotely, and well, I, I don't think that this is ever going to be over. I think that we, we're, we're going to see a big shift to remote work. Is that having team alignment becomes more important because we don't have all those cues that, for the last you know, hundred thousand years, we figured out how to you know when somebody looks like that, it means something. Um, and uh, so I'm I'm actually taking taking a, a training workshop on Friday uh, with this and, and taking a look at that. So alignment, team alignment, was never really something I thought about, and now I'm thinking it may actually become a new business for me. Very cool. So can people just search for Mirror Mirror and they'll come across this? Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, they should be excellent. Well, let me shift gears here again just a little bit. And uh, my next question has to do with the uh, messy language across the uh, ID, ISD, performance technology world. We, we are <clears throat> opportunity rich, as I like to joke. But uh, is there a favorite performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? And uh, further in the setup here is that Perhaps it's a term or a phrase that you feel is being misused or misconstrued and you want to put your spin on it. So what can you share with us? I think there's, a, there's a few that I think are really, uh, really important. But Do them all then, all. please. Okay. Do them all. Um, well, there's four terms. Uh, there's sort of uh, two pairs. Uh, the, f uh, the first pair would be um, uh, complex and complicated is that a lot of the HPT perspective is that things are complicated and we can figure them out. 
And uh, in closed systems, like, like an airplane, a helicopter, it's complicated. But we can, we can map the whole system. We know how they, how they all work together, right? Human beings are complex. And if you really want to understand complexity is think of a teenager, right? So on one day, you can tell that the teenager comes to you and says, gee, Dad, can I go out uh, with, uh, tonight? And you say, no. And they're all perturbed and they stomp off to the bedroom. The next, the next time they come and they say, hey, can I, can I go out? And you say, yeah, yes, you can. And they get all perturbed and they stomp out. And you don't understand why. Well, it's because they really didn't want to go out, but they wanted to ask you and say, well, then Dad won't let me go. And all that kind of stuff. And it's going like, how the heck am I supposed to figure this out? It changes every single time. That's a complex system. Right? What you did before isn't going to guarantee what you do now. And I think that that is the Achilles heel of just of, of performance analysis. Mm-hmm. Is that is it is it if we think that the system is complicated, but it's actually complex, and we think that we can design a solution? Um, so we have to. So basically, is it if, if we're looking at designing a performance solution, we have to take a complex system, find the pieces in it that are complicated, and say, okay, we can do, we can focus on this part, but we actually can't address the other part. Right? And yes. uh, yeah, very cool. And, so I think that, I think that's the big one is confusing the two, and this is this is this is just a piece of what's based on the Kinevin model C Y N E F I N, which uh, uh, Dave Snowden developed uh, out of IBM, and now with, and, uh, because there's 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 really five um, uh, orders of it. You have you have simple or ordered, you have complicated, you have complex, you also have chaotic, and then you have disorder when you're using the wrong process, the wrong approaches. And you fall into into disorder, but that's that that goes very deep. But I think the big one is just if we can just you know look at that complex and complicated. I think is is a big one. If it's complicated, we can use some really good solid tools. We can develop courses. We can do all that kind of stuff. But you know, uh, you know, don't uh, uh, don't bring a knife to a gunfight, and don't you know, don't bring a complicated approach to a complex uh, adaptive system. Um, and then the other one, is, which I think is really important when you're looking at uh, work, particularly complex work, is the difference between collaboration and cooperation. So collaboration, as I and, and many others define it, is working together for a common purpose. And quite often that common purpose is given by someone else. It could be your boss, could be your client, right? It's like we got to, and, and there's usually like a deliverable or something attached to that collaboration. We got we to gotta do stuff together to make stuff happen. Right? That's collaboration, and and, and that and, and we know how to do that well, and, and most businesses know how to do that well. And if you do have a clear objective, that's great. But if you don't have a clear objective, then you've got to be focused. Your focus should be more on cooperation, and cooperation is giving and sharing freely with no expectation of direct recompense or reciprocity. So blogging is a cooperative activity. I blog. I don't expect you know, for every ten blog posts, I'm going to get a new client. Right? I just I put it out there, and serendipitously, somebody lives. And, hey, I read that article. I'm interested in that, and that maybe that turns into a speaking engagement or work, or, or somebody buys a book or something like that. But you don't. But it's a non-linear process, and that's the, a real tough thing to get out or into some people's heads. Is that it, it is it is not linear. It's not if I do this, then I get that. But it is if I don't do this, I won't get anything. And, and, and in networks, like the prisoner's dilemma, right, is that cooperation is the best approach. And, and that's what's happening with this pandemic. If we cooperate as countries and as researchers, it'll be better for all of us. If we decide to, sit, to look after our own interests, okay, that's fine if we hold all the cards, right? But if we don't hold all the cards, all those, all those countries and organizations cooperating together are going to do better. So I think that those are, for me, those are really important to understand. What are we trying to help people do, collaborate or cooperate? If it's collaborate, then it's tools, it's courses. If it's, collabor- if it's cooperate, it's building safe spaces to talk, encouraging conversations, working out loud. Those are the kinds of things that don't have direct links, and they're bloody hard to sell to, unfortunately, which is a problem. Thank you for sharing that. Those are excellent, uh, great examples. Um, let me shift now into, uh, we're gonna, beginning the wrap up here, and what I'm looking for in this next, uh, with my next question is, uh, I'd like to explore some of the uh, people who have influenced you, uh, whether it was earlier in your journey or more recent, uh, regarding HPT or performance improvement or whatever we want to call it. Um, 
And what I was looking for is stories to kind of humanize some people that the audience may or may not know. So sometimes you want to do a shout out to somebody you know, but maybe others won't, or people that are we're more familiar with, but we really don't know personally. So um, you and I talked about this before I hit the record button. So you've got a couple of people that you'd like that you can share some stories with us. So please do. Yeah, well, probably the you know big influences on me for the last ten to 20, 20 almost twenty years now. Uh, probably the big one uh, was Jay Cross. And before I, before I talk about Jay specifically, uh, Jay uh, created the Internet Time Alliance in two thousand and nine, and he invited uh, several other people uh, to come and join. And the reason he did that he, because he said, "I'm writing all about this collaboration and cooperation stuff here, but I'm working alone." So this is crazy. And so um, uh, the Internet Time Alliance uh, became Jay and then Jane Hart, um, and uh, uh, Jane Hart out of the UK, uh, who runs the Institute for Performance and Learning. And uh, she, a wealth of knowledge uh, and information and publishing and everything that's there, fantastic. Um, Charles Jennings, and Charles uh, was the Chief Learning Officer of Thomson Reuters. And he is a proponent um, and a partner uh, with the what's known as the 702010 model, and the 702010 model is actually very much a um, an HPT type model because it basically it says is that uh, most working professionals learn three ways: through experience, through exposure, and through education. And generally speaking, over the course of your career, is that 70% of what you learn will come from experience. 20% from exposure to new and interesting different things, and 10% through formal training and education. It's a not a fixed number, and people get fixated on the numbers. Um, but uh, uh, this was a model that he used to actually, uh, he, I think when he was at Thomson Reuters, they had something like 15 LMSs. And he got that, he got that down to one. <laughs> mm. and, uh, and, and he used um, 70-20-10 kind of like Occam's razor. So, so why are we spending so much money on formal education and nothing on helping with experience and work and working through that? So Charles has been a big influence on me, and, uh, and Charles and Jane are these are people I speak with on a weekly basis. And uh, and then last, uh, or not not last, but um, at the end of the alphabet is Clark Quinn. So uh, Clark uh, lives out in the Bay Area. Um, he's our he's our token PhD on the team, um, and you know, I mean Clark designed the first computer-based education uh, uh, game. Uh, he, uh, he studied under um, uh, uh, Donald Norman, and uh, so, he's, so, so Clark is a cognitive scientist. He's written a number of wonderful books, um, revolutionized learning, uh, debunking myths um, in, in learning. Um, also, he's a, uh, an expert in mobile learning. And uh, so they have all been really influential. So Jay was the one who brought us together. I <clears throat> I met Jay because he was an early blogger. This would be around 2000, maybe 99. And uh, he, was in a, he, he was blogging before they called it really blogging. He had this website that he kept writing stuff on. And I was one of the few people in the world who actually commented on it. People were scared to comment, right? So, I, and so we, we kind of had these two-way sort of conversations. And uh, then come 2003, I said, matter of fact, just as I uh, lost my job and I became a freelancer, he happened to come here to New Brunswick, Canada. Uh, sp uh, and uh, He was working with a, uh, some startup that had lots of money. <clears throat> and, uh, and he said, I'm going to be in Moncton. He said, uh, is that near you? I said, that's like about 30 miles away. Yeah. yeah. And anyway, we got together for a beer. And uh, just a sec. It was really interesting because we sit down have the beer, and he looks at me and says, Harold, he said, we don't need to chit-chat, we know enough about each other. How can we work together? <laughs> I was like, cool. Um, and that was the start of a relationship. Um, and so uh, Jay was uh, very much like a renaissance man. <clears throat> he had interests all over the place. Probably the key, his key contribution was his book in 2006 on informal learning. And informal learning was never really talked about. Uh, before that. People mentioned it, <clears throat> but it wasn't talked about in a structured way. And he opened the door on that. And now you hear all kinds of people talking about informal learning and the importance of it and, and everything. So, you know, Jay came at it from, I think his first uh, job was selling computers. Uh, and then, uh, and he had, and he actually um, was one of the early um, uh, designers of the University of Phoenix. 
and went on and did all sorts of different things. But we did a number of different projects together, uh, the Signa project being the biggest one. Uh, we worked, uh, designed some uh, some uh, strategies for uh, 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 external development. Together. Just a second, I'm losing it. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, we wound up working. We did some work for the uh, European Union and uh, all sorts of different places, going different things. But he was just a constantly curious person. And, and, and the things I, the, you know, the little things I learned from him uh, were things like uh, this is in the early days of digital media. But he always had a camera with him, which is now now, now your mobile device, and he always took pictures. And he said, because someday I may need a picture to illustrate something or use a book or whatever. I think his Flickr account is still online. It's huge. Uh, but but he, was, you know, he was doing, I say, ca you know, capture stuff ahead of time, you know, use it, uh, reuse it, be always curious. Let's see how this works. Let's see how that works. Um, he was definitely not bounded by any uh, particular profession. And I, think that, and I think that that is one of the big challenges that we have is that if I'm an HPT person, I look at things from an HPT perspective. Um, you know, KM is, I mean, the knowledge management world is almost as enclosed as the HPT uh, professionals, the instructional design. I once uh, ran a workshop for a combined group through the um, uh, <clears throat> conference board, and they had two groups of people together for, for this uh, day conference. Uh, they had people from the knowledge management, and they had people from the um, learning and development. And it was like two completely different tribes of people. You know, there was one group that was really keen on technology, the other one hated technology. You know? And you could just see it, but you know, they're really, it depends upon you know, who, who molded you, who branded you, uh, who back, I mean, it, it's, it's like Protestant religion, which I call the first open source religion. If you don't like, if you don't like that church, you fork it, and you create a new church. And, then you, and I think that OD, KM, L&D, HPT have, are the same thing. Oh, I don't like what they're doing, we're gonna fork it and create something a little bit special. But having worked in most of them, is it, there's a lot of similarities. And if you're all focused on the same thing, the business or the person or the organization, then we really should be putting all this stuff together. And I think, you know, and that's the kind of stuff, because like with the Internet Time Alliance, we're not KM, we're not L&D, we're not any of that stuff. We're just people who are trying to, you know, uh, make working and learning a lot better. Are, is the Internet Time Alliance uh, still in operations without Jay? Are you guys still working together? And yep, we still we, we, we never really worked a lot together. It was more of a marketing thing, but the company exists, and uh, you, because it, I think once all five of us were hired to, to uh, but for, by one client, no one wants to hire five high trust consultants. <laughs> Uh, but I said, J Jay and I have worked together, and Jane and I have worked together. Charles and Clark have worked together uh, before. Um, I, you know, and like my work with City is that both Jane and Charles had worked with City uh, before that. So, uh, and and the thing is, is uh, the, the cool thing is, is this, quite often we'll get a um, uh, somebody will call us up and say, hey, you want to come speak or you want to do this or whatever. The first thing we do is that we go back into our little private channel and say, hey, anybody else know these people? Anybody else worked with them before? Yeah. And a lot of times they don't. Or a lot of times all all four of us will get the same request from a company, and, and then we go like, yeah, okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you realize that we know each other? <laughs> so it's so in a lot of ways it's 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 uh, it's a support group, it's a community of practice, mm -hmm. and it's a great little place to have bitch sessions. We all need those. And <laughs> you, you, do, yeah. you, you mentioned so you mentioned uh, before we started that you have another person that you were going to uh, tell a story on. Roger, Roger Kaufman. Oh yes, Roger Kaufman's book. Yeah, so uh, so Roger, uh, when I basically when I came, uh, yeah, well, I lost my job. I'm now a um, I, I'm now a, a a lone agent. And in the early days of my work, so 17 years ago, uh, I was doing a lot more HPT, ISD, instructional systems design stuff. Um, there were, at the time, there was a whole bunch of government money that went into creating e-learning startups here in New Brunswick. Uh, we had the information highway secretariat and things like that. So there are lots of small and medium-sized businesses that were in this space. 
Um, and so I often got called in to do the front end, so actually doing performance analyses. And uh, one of the first books that cost me a lot of money at the time was uh, Roger Kaufman's Strategic Plan for Success. And it was kind of like a good Bible that had everything in it. It's not the thing that you sit down and read the whole thing because you're just not going to do that. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And uh, and so I found I, I found that was really useful and um, oh, there was one more I can't remember her name now out of San Diego. Uh, Allison Reset. Yes, Allison. She she she, she, she had two two books that came out. Yeah, Allison Reset is it? Yes. Rosette, and, yes. Uh, yeah, and she is a. Uh, she had one on performance tools I think, or performance analysis, mm-hmm. which is a, it was like a quick and it was like a real good. That was a good book for sort of quick and dirty. Here's some tools. Here's some techniques. This is how you can sort of focus on what, on what's important. And I found that that was a really handy one. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Well, as part of the wrap up, then here, uh, I'm assuming that our audience is, uh, has a fair amount of people that are new to the field, or hopefully someday they find their way here to these uh, collection of videos. And what I'm looking for here is any parting words of wisdom or guidance that you might have for them. You know, whether they're younger people or middle-aged or older people, but they're new to this profession, which is a kind of a wide thing, HBT or instructional design or or whatever component uh, of, of that might be. But what would you share with them as words of wisdom as they begin their journey? I would say, first of all, is that don't get constrained into a discipline. Uh, the uh, is, is that uh, HPT is good uh, for certain things and other things uh, it's not so good for. Uh, so uh, be a multifaceted. Uh, what a, a friend of mine, Kenneth Mickelson, calls neo generalist, is that you can be deep in more than one area. And I think of that. Uh, and I find that you know what, what keeps you going is curiosity. So if you can develop a sense of curiosity, I think that really. Uh, makes a difference. And again, like I said, my mantra uh, is, you know, work is learning and learning is the work. So if you think about that, is that the learning stuff is only so you can work better or do things better, right? And it's not, it's not the, it, it's not the end state. Uh, well, as Jay Cross used to say, is that uh, uh, if executives could get a pill and give it to you and that you're trained, they'd buy the pill, right? Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so, so look at the big picture understand all the various facets uh, of uh, how these things are interconnected, particularly from a complexity perspective. Harold, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and insights with us here today. I wish you luck going forward and uh, have a great day.